Welcome to Hampton Plantation. I'm Ranger Hannah, and this first video will be your introduction to Hampton. So we'll check out a couple of the spots on the site uh, that we have today, and then look at them in reference to a map that we have from 1809, our oldest map of Hampton. And that will get you introduced to the site so that you have the context for our DC program, which we'll talk more about in our next video. Uh, so Hampton Plantation today is about 274 acres. Uh, when it was a plantation, it was even more than that. Uh, but today we have a lot of those same resources. We manage them differently. So you can see we have evidence of a controlled burn. Uh, we also take a lot more care with some of the species on the site, including things like the red cockaded woodpecker. So some of the things that the plantation would have used that we still have today uh, include the forest and the waters. Uh, so the forest a lot of the trees would have been cut down to use as lumber. Uh, they used to have cattle and other livestock that ranged in the woods uh, and they were able to get food that way. And then with the water, of course, you have fishing uh, and transportation. So some of those things we still have today uh, and we're just using them very differently now. All right, so the first stop on our site tour is the house itself. Uh, so this was built in the 1730s to 1750s. We don't have an exact date, but it was originally a smaller building. Uh, so where I am on this front porch, uh, right behind it is the original part of the house, uh, stopping at the edge of each porch. Uh, the section over there and the section over there uh, were both added in the 1760s. And at that point, the plantation was doing very well with rice cultivation. And the money from that goes into funding this house. Uh, the front porch was actually added in 1791. Uh, so before that, the house faced the other way. Uh, but 1791, at the height of rice production here, they add this grand Adamesque portico, uh, which really completes the house. And all of this was added on by the same family uh, from the 1730s. Uh, so the Ori family originally built the house, uh, but when a daughter married a Rutledge, after that, they're all Rutledges. Uh, and for another four generations after that first generation, the same family owns the house. So that's all the way from the 1730s through the 1960s that one family lives here, covering a lot of history. Another point on our site tour that has seen a lot of history uh, is this oak tree, which is called the George Washington Oak. Uh, that name comes from a family story that's been passed down from generations uh, from when George Washington visited the family in the house in 1791. At that point, it would have already been a pretty old tree. Uh, today, we think it's about 350 years old. Right, so now we're on the back side of the house, which was originally the front. So picture in the 1730s, the line just past each gutter. That's the original boundaries of the house, 1760s additions. And then in 1791, when they add the front porch on the other side, the house swings around and faces that way. But before that, it faced down towards the creek, which we'll see in just a second. Right, so you might be wondering why the front of the house originally faced down towards this creek. Well, this splits off from the South Santee River, so it has very easy access to the coast. So from the coastal towns of Georgetown or Charleston, it would be a lot easier to get into a boat, come up the coast, up the river, and then up the creek to access the house. So this is very important for transportation. And we do actually have some pictures of the kinds of boats that were in the, the waters of the low country. Uh, but besides transportation, this is also very important for tidal rice cultivation. Uh, so we're currently looking at a satellite image of the island across the creek from the park. Uh, the island is about 400 acres and it's created where the creek splits off and joins back in and you can see that on the map. You can also see a set of parallel lines that go across the island and that's the remains of the ditches and canals that were dug out to form the rice fields and those are in a very important part of how the fields were flooded using the tidal creek and the river. Uh, using those, they could control the water level in all of those rice fields. And if you overlay a historic map, you can still see then what we have today. Uh, so all of the digits that were dug out still survive, and that really shows you how much work was put into cultivating and maintaining that island. Okay. Uh, so we are standing now at the rice trunk. And this was called a trunk because originally it was made out of a hollowed out tree trunk. So we have a gate right next to me and underneath, there is a pipeline, also made out of wood, uh, that's buried in the sand, connected to the gate on the opposite side. Now that side has the rice field, but the side that I'm standing on is the creek. 
and we'll be using the creek to flood the rice field. So this is where our tidal cultivation comes into play. At high tide, when the water level is high on this side, we could lift this gate and have water flow through that pipeline, push that gate open, and go into the field. When you close that gate, the water is trapped in the field and you have a flooded rice field. Uh, in, on the other hand, uh, at low tide, you can open the opposite gate and the water will flow back out through this gate back into the creek. And that is how they use this trunk system to control the water level as they were growing rice. So the building that you see behind me now is the historic kitchen building. Right now we are about halfway between the house and the creek and you can see on the map from 1809 what building we believe is the kitchen. That would have been the kitchen from the 1700s uh, but it did burn down at one point and they rebuilt another one in the same spot. So this building is from the mid 1800s. This is one of only two surviving buildings that we have today but a working plantation needed a lot of outbuildings, uh, including the kitchen, and most of them would have been in this general area. Uh, the kitchen is a separate building from the house for a couple different reasons. A big one is that it's very hot. Uh, with multiple fireplaces in there in the middle of summer, uh, cooking all day, that's a lot of heat to have attached to the house. Uh, there is some fire risk. Like I mentioned, the building had burned down before, and also pre-Civil War, the workers in the kitchen would have been enslaved women. Uh, and they were being kept separate from the rest of the house uh, in a building that was still close enough that from the house you can see it. And so we're now inside the house and this is where you can see where a lot of that wood that was cut down on the plantation went. Uh, mostly cypress and pine that went into the walls and the ceiling and the floor of this big manor house. Uh, when you're looking at certain parts of the house where we have it deconstructed, you can see the handwork uh, that went into the building uh, by the carpenters who were enslaved here when the house was constructed. Uh, so using hand tools, uh, things like this adze, they were able to cut down huge logs to make the beams that make up the construction of the house, the inner parts that keep everything together. Uh, so this one is used, it's very heavy, uh, for cutting down logs, big chunks of it. Uh, so if you look at the picture of the beams, in the ceiling of the house. You can still see the marks that are left behind from the hand healing. Uh, they also used things like this auger, which is the equivalent today of a drill. Uh, and one of the cool things about how the house is constructed is that it was put together with something called mortise and tenon joints, which just means that rather than have these huge beams nailed together, they are fitted to slot into each other, um, sometimes with pegs, which would be good use for the auger, um, or just by carving them out. Uh, so you can see places in the house where they fit together. Uh, they're not nailed, they fit. Uh, and that has kept the house standing uh, for hundreds of years, even through some major hurricanes. Uh, so where we're standing now, you can see on the map originally had a cluster of outbuildings. Uh, so picture um, farm animals wandering around, maybe being able to hear a blacksmith or hear a carpenter working. Uh, so there were people in this area using the space, but today trees have grown back up. Now, when this was a plantation, most of these trees would have been cut down and used for things like fences or buildings. Uh, today, we still manage the trees uh, where we do controlled burns, but we're not cutting them down for lumber. Rather, we are controlling all the debris to prevent wildfires. Uh, and we're trying to bring back the longleaf pine uh, which is a habitat for red cockaded woodpeckers, which is a protected species that we're trying to bring back. Uh, also with all the woods around us today, you can get a better idea of visiting of how it would have looked historically. Uh, the waterways as well. Uh, for the plantation, this would have been a major agricultural resource. This is where they're planting the rice and where they're getting all of the water to grow the rice, uh, where they're transporting rice and people uh, down the river to get to the cities. Uh, for us, we're still managing the water, but maybe for things like uh, ducks, otters, other species that live there, um, and just as a resource that people can enjoy and use today. So archaeology is a very important part of how we learn the history and the story of Hampton Plantation. So archaeology is this science where we can dig things back up, look at things that are still left behind by people who used to live here to learn more about their lives. 
So archaeology is how we got this brick foundation behind me, uh, one of the original slave dwellings that we were able to unearth and see the size of the building where they used to live. And we also have artifacts that we find out here, objects that were left behind, uh, things like a broken teapot that someone who lived here may have used, glass beads that someone may have used, um, and even a coin with a hole through it that may have been a part of a piece of jewelry that someone owned. And all of these things tell us a little bit more about the stories and the lives of people who lived here at Hampton. Uh, so we are standing now uh, in the foundation of one of the original slave dwellings here at Hampton. So before 1865 and the end of the Civil War, there was a set of buildings here where enslaved families lived. Uh, this building would actually have been two rooms and there would have been a family in each room. So we're here in the middle, have a door on each side and a fireplace on each side for each family to use. So it's not a very large building and it's still very close to where the landowner is and the plantation owner. Uh, so just past here, there are more trees grown up now, but back then there would have been a clear line of sight where the plantation owner would have been able to see the people living here even when they weren't working on their own free time. So when we go into our next video, we'll talk a little bit more about that transition from after the end of slavery, after the official end of the plantation, how rice was still grown here and what the lives were like um, in relation to the plantation owner as well for people who would have lived in these buildings and transitioned from being enslaved to being free.